Today on the podcast, the last Metroid is in captivity and the galaxy is at peace. Welcome to Lore Party, the podcast that explores the stories, characters, and lore behind some of our favorite video game universes. I'm your host, Neil. And I'm Michael. I'm sure you can tell already, I'm making the entire Lore Party team play through the Metroid franchise. I, I, I have noticed, and uh, I, th- so far this has been a good thing. This is, hasn't been like, Neil makes us suffer through Metroid. <laughs> I think it's been a fun experience for everyone. Yeah, it's, it's you're, you're sharing. It. Right. <laughs> like, you had Abu who tried his best and couldn't get through it. You had Lawrence <laughs> who just wasn't able to finish this impossible game as a kid and circled back to it. And now you're at what I would argue the best of the bunch, Super Metroid. Yeah, it, it, it's Super Metroid is kind of a game that I know through rep, uh, reputation more than actual experience. Because like I've watched a lot of G4 as a kid. I listened to a lot of video game podcasts. Everyone loves Super Metroid. And it's been one of those things that's been on my sort of list of shame for, for many years. So it's, it's, it's good to be able to actually get to it. Yeah, it's one of those uh, little Super Nintendo darling games between like that Earthbound Chrono Trigger. Like that's where I put it. It's one of those essential games that you might not have played. I don't know, man, because uh, I'm used to talking about just a bunch of indie games on here. <laughs> it's good to be able to play something as mainstream as a big Nintendo franchise. <laughs> that's fair. Oh, the big mainstream Nintendo franchise everyone knows and loves. Yeah, I'm selling Metroid. out. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are your thoughts so far? How far are you in the game? I'm about halfway through. Uh, I'm just at the, um, oh, what's his name? A Photon? Fanto? Oh, Fantoon. Fantoon. You're in the wrecked right. ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, so, like, I'm about there. So, from what I'm seeing, I'm about, like, halfway through. And it's it's been really good so far. Not quite in terms of a lore thing, but the thing that struck out to me the most is just the mood and atmosphere. It's it's weird. Oh, that, that's the biggest part of the game. Yes. Yeah, and it's like weird, like this game that's almost as old as I am, which is almost 30 years old, <laughs> uh, it has a better atmosphere than most games coming out today. And it's it's weird because like you think that it's this big sci-fi action adventure game and it has more of like a survival horror atmosphere with like the music. Especially the beginning of the game. Like yeah. you're you start from Metroid 2, you go to drop off the last Metroid, and then everything just goes to hell immediately. And that's after even like this weird little uh, narrative, you see Samus talk for the first time, or rather, like, yeah. you see her use words. She's, like, typing, like, a log, basically, of her adventures. Yeah, and it's, like, even, like, before you hit start, it's, like, you, you put in the cartridge, quote-unquote, right. and, you, and you hit go, and it's, like, instead of, like, like Link to the Past or whatnot, where you have this, this big, like, swelling musical score, you just have this, like, like this, like, bling, like this very understated like music hit and it's like it, it it doesn't have like that big like rousing adventure it's like oh i'm i'm not going to be in a safe place throughout this game it's like it's almost like bloodborne in that way yeah it's set up as a horror film the first cutscene is people laying dead on a floor yeah uh, yeah that's no that's the title I, screen that's not even a cutscene that's yeah. the opening title sequence yeah and it's it's weird like seeing like dead people in a nintendo game <laughs> right it's it's like the, like especially old nintendo is like oh no these people are just knocked out for a while they'll come back eventually it's like no nah, man these people are dead because <laughs> at this point the only other game you have on this console is super mario brothers 3 and yoshi island <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, and it, it, it's something that you don't really expect out of especially games this old exactly going off of the first maybe in like 15 minutes of the game is something that you don't also expect in super nintendo games is voice moonwalking where you have oh. this oh oh yeah moonwalk oh, of course <laughs> no, I've, I've played enough michael jackson's moonwalker on super nintendo to where i just expect that out of every game but no it's, it's a core it's, feature to, <laughs> exactly and you have but you have this voice over setting up the universe and it, it was so weird like not only to hear a voiceover but it's like who is this 
person. Is that an actual character? Am I going to see this person? Is this like a um, the like the the elusive man, like this big person who's overseeing everything, or is this just kind of someone setting up the the universe of what you're about to play? So, like most things in 1994, it just, it is what it is. Uh, It's the narrator, and that's the only narration point you really get that isn't Samus. Uh, This guy, Daniel Osen, Osen, he was, and I believe still is, a Nintendo employee who was involved in the localization of the game. Really, to me at least, this is, you can view it as like a transmission or something, like from the Galactic Federation to or from Samus, whatever, but... Really, it's just a big attention grabber and very understated way to start the game. It's very metallic, cold, computerized, and the very next thing you see is a close-up of Samus's face, which you've never gotten before. You get to see Samus typing out words conveying thought and her thoughts and emotions, which you never got to see before. So if anything, after that very unsettling intro and an even more somehow unsettling, simple, tied-up synopsis of the last game, it it lunges you into this world. Yeah, and, and it's sort of like about the whole world, you see Samus delivering the the Metroid larva that she got at the end of Metroid 2 to these scientists being like, hey, here's this thing, study it and you know, maybe harness this energy or, or something. And it's like, it makes me think, it's like, are the human race like desperate for energy at this point that they're now going to take the enemy to try to use it for their own will? It's like, what do we really know about the greater universe and sort of like the state of humans and why would they want to harvest Metroids? Because at this point, we've only seen them be offensive rather than like a potential resource. Human civilization is pretty technologically advanced at this point right now. It's, uh, you know, they're, it's just basic sci-fi. They're just up in space colonies doing their things and... The Metroids, as you said, yeah, they have been completely offensive up until this point. Uh, It's actually in the opening of the game. uh, The scientists are just like, all right, yeah, might as well research it more or less. Uh, They just decide to do it because Samus shows up with it. Um, Because this is immediately after Metroid 2 ends. She grabs it, she goes, she hands it off. And that's really just that. She didn't have the heart to kill it. Maybe she saw some potential in it on SR388. Somewhere down the road, it was just decided, hey, it's a very good decision that we check this thing out, which I believe they were doing originally uh, before the original Metroid. They were checking them out, or they were planning to check them out. Space pirates stole them, went to Zebes, and started cloning them. And now it's just kind of back to where it was in this big roundabout way. As stated in the intro, they're just studying it for its energy-producing properties, which we've never really heard of until this point, but and that the scientists think it's going to benefit mankind in some way. It's really weird because we've only seen them drain energy rather than give energy, but this is something that kind of comes along towards the end of the game that we'll see a little more about it. Yeah, and it, 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 it's, it's also neat seeing Samus interacting with other humans because at this point, I, I've only played a little bit of the first Metroid and none of Metroid 2, but she doesn't really interact with other people, as it were. She's just going through these environments and essentially just shooting everything that's there. Right. Because that, that's her mission. But it's like this is the first time we see her sort of do something for, in some ways, for the greater good. Or being like, oh, I have this Metroid larva. This thing could be very helpful for humanity rather than just, you know, like, hey, <laughs> treating it sort of like a bounty and trying to get like a you know, sweet paycheck out of it. Right. Which, yeah, that's the thing we have to bear in mind. She is a bounty hunter. Her last gig was, hey, go exterminate these guys. And she did that job mostly and is trying to maybe not squeeze a little more out of it, but just trying to trying to use herself almost for a greater good because everything else has been very mission based which we only hear about her talking with people in the game manuals uh just right hey like here's some dough we know you know zebus we know you're basically a tank like go infiltrate it stop the pirates hey great job on zebus you're now familiar with the metroids after you fought them there and destroyed mother brain go to the metroid planet mess that up so this is the third metroid game and it's the first time that it doesn't start with the mission we're starting with the completion of a mission and then it just it gets batshit from there yeah and it's like you know in some ways it like it reminded me of like how like an indiana jones movie is structured where it's like okay let's end you know let's start the thing off with the end of a previous adventure 
let's get the some of the expected stuff out of the way. So now we can do sort of like the new stuff, you know, the new environments, the new abilities or, or whatever. That's a very good way to put it. I like that comparison a lot. When you first land on on Zebus and you're going down the the elevator shaft, which is the same from my understanding, the same. Yeah, that was the, that's the exploded Torian. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wow. Like you, you really are just like going back. And, but it's like a little different, too, where you go when, once you get to the bottom. You go left to where the morph ball is, but as soon as you get that, it's like you sort of expect to be like, okay, you know, it's just doing the same stuff. And then like that security camera comes on and starts like looking at you and it's like, right, that wasn't there the first time. Yeah. And it's like, what, what exactly is going on? And sort of like on that, on that same thing, it's like, why do they go back to Zebus? Is, was there something specifically on Zebus that they were looking for? Do they need... I don't know, some energy or something or resource from the from the planet. So there's a couple things to consider. One, the space pirates are dumb. <laughs> the Metroid Prime lore and logbooks will show you that. Now, we're not discussing 3D games, really, but like they're dumb. <laughs> um, secondly, Mother Brain controlled the space pirates. Basically, she bent them to her will. Mother Brain was destroyed. The space pirates now reverted back to their leader, their general, Ridley, who you just fought, and that's the whole reason you're at Zebus. He stole the baby, you're chasing after him, this isn't your mission, this is your fucking vendetta. Ooh. You're going after him, you thought he's dead, he took what you just gave just to help mankind in general in some way. This time it's personal. <laughs> <laughs> this time it's per yeah after you after you killing your parents murderer shows back up now it's especially personal so you go back to zevis you take in the rain for a second wow this is cool you jump down in torian the space pirates show up which also this is the first time you ever even fight the space pirates in the metroid franchise yeah they were not in the original at all so you're fighting them off. They're shooting laser beams out of lobster claw out of their lobster claws. The whole thing's nuts, and you're you realize the first place you see them is Torian, which is the only destroyed thing on the planet. So it's never really es explicitly stated, but they're pretty much on a mission to rebuild Torian and everything with it, which may or may not include at this point in time for you, Mother Brain. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, they're just going back to basics. Everyone thinks Torian's just destroyed. Obviously, no one's checked it out because no one said anything to you. They've just been laying low and getting their whole operation back up and running. Yeah, it's 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 kind of funny in that way you say it's like back to basics because, like I mentioned, it's like it's like structured like you know an Indiana Jones thing. But then then at some point is we it kind of worried me. I was like, oh, is this like the Home Alone 2 of video games where it's just like, oh, it's happening again? <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same situation. You're fighting the same enemies, but you're not fighting the same enemies. No. You're fighting, you know, you're fighting the space pirates, even though it's it's similar. It's a little bit, in some ways, kind of like deformed, like uh, how I mentioned with like the security camera thing. It's like, it's, it's that little hint of what you expect is not going to be what actually happens. Right. Now, this game might as well be Metroid Remastered, um, yeah. you know, from 86 to 94. But uh, they pretty much go out of their way to, like, expand on the lore of the planet, the the Federation, the pirates. Everything all kind of comes together in this game and really kicks off uh, the franchise as a whole uh, beyond the, the discovery of the baby at the end of Metroid 2. Because really now this is the story of the baby Metroid and what happens with it. Now that I'm getting into sort of these more unique environments and things like that, what do you think I should be looking out for? Because like one of the hints you gave me a while ago when we first talked about doing Super Metroid was like, oh, read the manual. Because <laughs> like for some of these things, because like I, I, you know, I was listening to the other the other episodes and be like, how does how does he know all this stuff? Like, how does he know like what these aliens are called? Like, the rule of thumb is if you play any video game before 2006, read the manual. <laughs> Like, I'm not, like, some, like, uber millennial, like, kid who only plays Fortnite, <laughs> but it, it, it's, like, I'm, I'm used to, like, having games, like, do more environmental storytelling, and Super Metroid, of course, is, is riddled with it, so, like, on that sort of thing, like, are there, like, environmental clues and things like that I should be now looking out for now that I'm getting into some of the more unique aspects of Super Metroid? 
you're going to explore around uh, Brinstar, I believe, and you're going to find these two little creatures. And you're going to see them running around. You're going to see them crouch down. You're going to see them jump up a giant shaft that is impossible to, to traverse. Yeah. And they're going to teach you uh, game mechanics, basically, just by doing their own animations in the background, doing things that they just biologically do. Literally, by watching the environment, you're going to learn how this game works, and you're going to learn tricks from the species of Zebus to help you get through. Eventually, you'll find some monkeys that are called uh, Edicoons, and they're going to show you how to wall jump and traverse this horrible environment that you're in. It's 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 really weird kind of like having to not necessarily learn from the environment, because like I've played a lot of games where you have to do that kind of thing. But it's like, how do I translate to what I'm seeing to what I'm doing? I see this thing happening. I think I can do this, but how do I actually pull this off? The grapple beam is a very good example of that, too, which like you're going to see like, OK, this generates electricity. It lets me... uh connect myself to certain metals and then you'll find against a certain boss that uh it brings those same properties to the table which there's no other indicator to tell you you can do this outside of just knowing the physical properties of this item that isn't even a weapon it's really interesting seeing like not necessarily lore in mechanics but like how like the the lore and story of the metroid games really sort of intertwined with them mechanically and environmentally exactly and with and with what what the what the story like actual like plot points are uh and it's 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 just it's it's really been fascinating to me seeing how all of those things intertwine because I, I i never really grew up on nintendo games and nintendo does those things really really well yeah and, and seeing seeing them sort of at their best with this unique environment, with this unique, you know, sort of cast and, you know, genre, which I, all of which I love, it's like, this game is firing on all cylinders for me, so. And we're at like the, just like as a disclaimer in general, like we haven't really been talking about lore heavy things, because really like you're, we're just not that far into it yet. Because there's going to be a lot of interesting things coming up, like creature, a bunch of creatures that look like Metroids, but aren't Metroids. We're going to see what happened to the baby Metroid itself. We're going to see what's going on with uh, Ridley, who we were chasing. Like I said, we're going to see what's going on with uh, the space pirates and what they've been up to and why they're back in Torian in general. And it's only going to get better. And then there's going to be certain things... uh, going into the next game, Metroid Fusion, where there's going to be a lot of ramifications because of the ending of Super Metroid and how it plays even further into the Galactic Federation, who we still haven't talked that much about yet. I know the big thing that happens at the end of Super Metroid, right. but I don't know how we get there. So now now it's like for me, like, okay, it's time it's time to connect the dots. How do, how do we get here and what are the big big consequences of of right that and i'm gonna tell you you're you're playing a horror movie right now this is it's obviously metroid takes huge uh inspiration from the alien franchise and (laughs) that that is really see those things come into play (laughs) oh yeah and that about wraps it up for this episode we want to thank you for tuning in being part of the show be sure to connect with us on Twitter at lore underscore party and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>